thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. Uh, Diana, it's great to have you back. Nikki, Ted, great to have you here as new friends of the Dole Institute. Let me start tonight and ask you, you focus in your book on nine women. How did you select those nine women? I think the best answer is, you know, we could have looked at more, but within the confines of a book, you can only do so much. So we wanted diversity. We wanted Democrats, Republicans. We wanted different uh, parts of the country. To some extent, we wanted different ages. Um, we, we knew on the basis of nine, you can't make generalizations that are 100% certain. And you know, we say as much in the book that we think our conclusions are hypotheses that other people might now run with. But in order to make even those kinds of hypotheses, we needed a, a fairly diverse group. Yeah. We, we also included women. Um, you know, there's the White House project that's been around for the last couple of election cycles. And they had eight in 08. So several of the women that the White House project had identified several years before the 2008 election. Olympia Snow, Kathleen Sebelius were both in there. And uh, you know, we, we wanted to also consider this notion. Barbara Lee, who had been here several years ago when you did the last round on Madam President six years ago with her foundation, had talked about looking at women governors. So we wanted to look at some of the women governors who had been through some of Barbara Lee's training as port, sort of a pipeline to the presidency. We also made the observation that when a, a male is elected to a senatorship, uh, immediately he's cast as a future presidential hopeful. For example, Scott Brown hadn't even been sworn in yet in Massachusetts, and uh, the URL scottbrown.com or scottbrown2012.com was already purchased. But so many women had been in Washington for so many years. Uh, as legislators and working on important work, and, and yet their names never bubbled to the top. And we were curious, why not? How, how did you decide that you wanted to write this book? I mean, all three of you have studied mm -hmm. similar topics, but how did, did the book actually come about? It was your idea, Ted. It's Ted. Well, uh, yeah, I guess it was my idea. Um, I, I've been a political nerd since I was, you know, I don't know. I, my, my parents still remember my sister and I in 1960 staging a Nixon-Kennedy debate with our stuffed animals. Um, my elephant beat her rabbit. Uh, and uh, during all of those years of nerddom, um, what always fascinated me were the magazine issues that would come out way in advance of a presidential election that would preview the eight or 10 or 12 people who ought to be considered. And it simply struck me after seeing so many of those issues of so many magazines that women were not making it onto that list. Mm -hmm. They were not being uh, thought to be presidential. They were uh, thought for some reason not to be of presidential timber. And so, you know, as, a, as an academic, you tend to ask, well, why? And that, for me, was the origin of the book. Well, why is it that women are not quickly, uh, you know, coming, coming into those lists? Well, and Ted originally proposed this. It was a conference paper. For those graduate students out there, mm -hmm. you can take conference papers and turn them into publications. This is living mm -hmm. proof of it. Uh, we started this as a conference program, and we each did two women. And there was an editor who Nikki had worked with on her Elizabeth Dole book who was in the audience and came up and talked to us and said, ah, oh, you know, can you expand this and make it a book? Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, we said, sure. And then it was a matter of picking and choosing. Yeah. Right. right. For example, uh, two of the women I worked on, Linda Lingle and Christine Gregoire, uh, often I will hear people say, I, I don't know who they are. You know, it's the governor of Washington State, former governor of Hawaii. Uh, but little known, I think, on the national stage, and begs the question, why not? Why are they not well known? I know, I think I know the answer to the question, but I'm gonna ask it in a neutral way. Is there a double standard in the way that women are covered by the news media and how they're judged by their appearance? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you said it first. <laughs> well, he knew the answer. Yeah. 
Well, actually, my, one of my co-authors from when I was here at KU, Kelly Winfrey, one of my graduate students who just finished, she and I did an article uh, for communication studies after the 2008 election that Barbara alluded to, uh, looking at the news coverage of Palin and Clinton mm -hmm. and the sexism mm -hmm. that was there. And it was appalling. I know when I had my husband read it to edit it before we sent it off, he just said, oh dear, you're making this stuff up. Chris Matthews did not say that. Or that photographer, I said, here it is. You know, here it is. And, and I, I think it, it is far worse than you maybe think it is. And, and these women who we studied really did have some of that scrutiny. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's more complicated for women to present themselves physically in public because there is no uniform because there's a lack of a legacy. Um, we haven't had a woman that we could say this is what a woman president looks like. And so the press tends to cover her appearance before they cover what she stands for and what she plans to do as president. Now there are, you know, there is discrimination based on appearance generally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not just something that affects women. Uh, there's discrimination against people who are overweight discrimination against people who are short. But it seems to be particularly intense for women candidates as opposed to uh, men candidates. Uh, Chris Christie, you know, should he have run or should he run, will certainly get some <laughs> attention because of uh, his weight. But he will not be ruled out because of his weight. Uh, a woman, comparable woman, might be ruled out. And a good example of that is um, Elizabeth Edwards. Uh, when her husband was vice president, um, she was ridiculed for her weight and her appearance. And even after she died, I can recall reading some articles about her that pointed to her appearance. Um, and I, I think it's an example of the scrutiny mm -hmm. uh, that women, uh, women feel when they run for office or when they're even spouses of a candidate. Yeah. Why, why, though, in studying this, why did you find that to be the case? Because uh, I, I can't remember a single time somebody saying, why is the president not wearing a suit today? Or why is Governor Romney wearing jeans today instead of wearing a suit? You just, you know, who's wearing, I had a candidate once who was, who was noted for wearing Gucci loafers, and that did make the media, yeah, but yeah. that's the only example I can think well, of that with men. Jimmy Carter with his cardigans. Yeah. You know, he, if you remember, those of you who are old enough. And blue remember, jeans. And blue mm -hmm. jeans, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that there was some criticism there, but nothing like what women go through. And you know, we had some examples in the book. Uh, for instance, Kathleen Sebelius told a story about being in the first debate when she was running for governor the first time, and she had on some peep toe shoes, and the AP writer, who's a very good political writer, talked about the color of her toenail polish. Mm -hmm. And this was like the lead thing, that she had shown up, and, and he was describing what she was wearing, and then if you remember when Michelle Bachman was running, there were photographs of her French nails mm -hmm. and whether or not these were appropriate for someone running for president, whether the, the way they were shaped and the French nails were appropriate. Mm -hmm. And then Nancy Pelosi, we mentioned this, I, I don't remember if it was in the chapter or not, but uh, I think somewhere in the book, when she first uh, became speaker, there was this whole series of her pearls. And they had taken neck shots of her in the first few weeks she'd worn like six different kinds of pearls and this was you know nobody has done six different kinds of neckties maybe that's because there's not enough variety I don't know but. there's plenty of variety <laughs> but but nobody um, I, I think uh, what you wear can send messages but for men the messages are maybe received but they're quickly pushed aside you know he's more casual he's more uptight but the messages are quickly pushed aside. Dianne Feinstein, who has uh, a fine fashion taste, um, early in her career had a really tough time getting people to uh, think that she had any understanding whatsoever that, of the problems that the disadvantaged um, experienced in San Francisco because her attire screamed that she was from uh, a wealthy part of the city. And you know, her attire was sending a message that got in her way as a public servant. What are some of the other key differences that women seeking high office face other than men seeking high office? Well, 
there are so many. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, where, one where of do the, you, start? you know, one